Hello friends, my name is JJ. So last year I was in Washington DC and got a chance to visit the fabulous National Museum of American History, which is full of all sorts of amazing exhibits documenting the evolution of American culture. And their giant gift shop was full of all sorts of fun stuff as well. Though I couldn't help but noticing that amid all of the knickknacks of Elvis Presley and Captain Kirk, they had a little section devoted to Mario souvenirs. And I was like, hey now, Mario's not American. He comes from Japan. Everybody knows that. But then I was like, wait, who actually made Mario? Was it really all Japan? Or was it more of a collaboration between Japan and America? With both countries playing an equal sized role. And then I realized that Mario is a very fascinating character when you start to break down his origin story. He is perhaps one of the most truly globalized characters in existence today. An icon whose roots span multiple cultures and thus truly blurs the lines of what it means to come from somewhere. So the story of Mario begins with a guy from Chester, Illinois, named Elsie Chrysler Cigar. Cigar dreamed of being a famous cartoonist, and in 1919 was hired to draw a syndicated comic strip for the papers of the mighty Hearst Newspaper Empire. The strip was called Thimble Theater, and it was about the adventures of a guy named Castor Oil and his sister, Olive Oil. In 1929, Castor and Olive went on an adventure that required them to hire a sailor, and they went with this guy, a new character known as Popeye the Sailor Man. And it was one of those situations where someone who is brought on initially to just be a minor supporting character becomes so popular that he completely takes over. In 1931, the strip was renamed Thimble Theater starring Popeye, and later just Popeye. By 1932, Popeye was popular enough to start appearing in animated shorts for movie theaters, which were later rebroadcast on TV once TV was invented. In the 1960s, he became the star of a string of made-for-TV animated shows, which continued into the 1980s. Meanwhile, American cartoons had been very popular in Japan from the very beginning, and had tremendous influence on the development of animation in that country. Even when Japanese-US relations reached their low point in the lead-up to World War II, you can still see obvious American influence in their anti-American propaganda cartoons. After the war, however, when US-Japanese relations were normalized, it became much less taboo for the Japanese middle class to embrace American culture. American cartoons became more popular than ever, with Japanese kids knowing and loving all of the big, iconic American characters. The post-war era also saw deepening integration of the Japanese and American economies, with Japanese firms designing more and more products explicitly for American consumers, including cultural products. In the 1960s, a Japanese company called Nintendo obtained the rights from Hearst Enterprises to make Popeye-themed products in Japan. They made Popeye playing cards and Popeye brand ramen seasoning. But as the years went on, they wanted to do something more ambitious. A Popeye arcade game. A game where you could play as Popeye and rescue Olive Oil, who is now Popeye's girlfriend, from the evil Bluto, the villain of the Popeye animated series. Nintendo started development on this game in early 1981, but the Hearst people got cold feet for some reason and production was abruptly halted. Nintendo wouldn't wind up releasing a Popeye arcade game until a year later in 1982. But Nintendo still had to get something out for 1981, so they retooled their half-started Popeye game into something new, under the direction of a young employee named Shigeru Miyamoto. Miyamoto made up new generic characters to replace the Popeye ones. So Olive Oil became this generic pink lady and the bad guy became a big angry gorilla named Donkey Kong. And Obvious ripoff of King Kong that would later get Nintendo sued. And then the Popeye character, the guy the player controlled, became this weird little man. Miyamoto has admitted that basically everything about the way that this guy looks was dictated by the technological difficulties of creating a recognizably humanoid figure when all you're given to work with is a tiny grid of less than 200 pixels. As he describes in this interview, published on the official Nintendo website, the reason the guy wears overalls is because it was easier to make the movement of his arms visible if they were a different color from the rest of his torso. And the reason why he has a hat and a mustache is just because that was the easiest way to draw a simple face. You have to remember that this was at a time when most video game characters looked like this, so having a game starring something resembling a human being at all was considered quite the 
marvel of technology. The game was, of course, Donkey Kong, which came out in Japan in August of 1981 and was exported to America a few months later. But before that could happen, Nintendo's team in the US had to localize the game for American audiences. And it was through this process that the character of Mario, that we all know and love today, was truly born. So localization refers to the process through which some cultural work is made more culturally accessible to audiences in a foreign land. Unlike translation, which only refers to changing the text of a work from one language to another, Localization occurs when the importer makes changes to a work's visuals or audio or script to ensure things like the setting or theme or characters will be understood and enjoyed by a foreign audience. Localization played a very big role when Japanese video games were first starting to be imported to America in the 1980s, largely because despite decades of warming US-Japanese relations, the two countries still regarded each other as quite exotic places with little overlap in cultural values. When it came to Donkey Kong, the localization process entailed redesigning the characters to make them more compelling to US players. When we compare the artwork used on the side of the Japanese arcade cabinet to the revised artwork, you can see that they have made Donkey Kong look more menacing, the girl look more sexy, and the guy look more fierce. The American art was done by Xavier Leslie Carbarga, an American illustrator who specialized in the sort of neo-mid-century cartoon art that was briefly fashionable in the 1980s. On his Facebook wall, I noticed he had a post where he admitted to specifically modeling his version of the Popeye stand-in character after Popeye. By the way, he adds, I was the first to put white gloves on him, but that's natural since I am so vintage animation steeped. Here he is referring to the long-standing American cliche of having cartoon characters wear white gloves, a tradition that's started, not unlike Mario's overalls, in order to help improve the contrast of a character's hands in the era of black and white. But if there is one thing that Americans like more than squinty-eyed characters wearing gloves, it is characters with names. And this guy didn't have one. The Japanese simply called him the Jump Man, and that wasn't gonna fly in America. So the legend goes that the staff at Nintendo of America decided to name the Jump Man after the manager of the Seattle office complex where they worked a guy named Mario Sigali. The wonderful YouTuber gaming historian, who does a lot more independent research than most video game YouTubers, confirms in a video on this topic that Mario Sigali did in fact exist and was in fact the landlord of the Washington State office plex that Nintendo occupied at the time of Donkey Kong's American release. Now, Mario is a very stereotypically Italian name and Mario Sigali was himself Italian-American, so this naming marked the critical moment in which it was decided that the jump man should be understood to be Italian. The idea of an Italian man with dark hair and a mustache is a common stereotype in American culture, so I doubt it was a coincidence that they thought Mario Sigali's name felt right for this guy. The next big moment came in 1983, when Nintendo of Japan made a Donkey Kong spin-off game called Mario Brothers, which was notable not only for being the first Nintendo game to feature the name Mario in the title, but also the first game to feature Mario's younger brother. Once again, the Japanese team did not bother to give this new character a name, so once again it fell to the Americans. They gave him the equally stereotypical Italian name of Luigi, thereby deepening Mario's Italianness even further. In 1985, Nintendo made a sequel to Mario Bros for their newfangled home gaming machine called Super Mario Bros, followed by another sequel in 1986 called Super Mario Bros. 2. And these games are relevant for our purposes primarily because their popularity inspired a 1989 American TV show known as the Super Mario Brothers Super Show. The show was half animation and half live action with the live action bits containing the most fleshing out of Mario's biography seen to date. Mario was played by Captain Lou Albano, an Italian immigrant who had grown up in New York City and went on to great fame and fortune on the professional wrestling circuit. And the biography of the Mario that he played seems to have been loosely based on his own life. He's been going to night school for over 300 years. Don't mean nothing. How about the Baba Pasquale Caputo? 
He's been going to high school almost as long. Just like Lou, Mario was a working class Italian American who lived in New York, specifically Brooklyn in this case. Unlike Lou, however, Mario was not a professional wrestler, but just a slovenly plumber, a job which had sort of been lightly alluded to in the first Mario Brothers game, but was now made a core part of Mario's identity. It was all classic localization. The transformation of a guy who had become the most famous video game character in America into someone who was himself identifiably American. But what is interesting is that the Japanese more or less just passively accepted what the Americans were doing to their character. Though Mario had appeared in some Japanese comics and cartoons and things, Nintendo of Japan had never really given him much of a story or even personality beyond being an ordinary looking human who lived in a magical fantasy world for some reason. The Super Mario Brothers Super Show, by contrast, established the idea that Mario and his brother traveled from America to the fantasy world of the games through a magic warp pipe. Now, for reasons that I have not heard explained, Nintendo did not maintain a relationship with Captain Lou after the Super Mario Brothers Super Show ended. The premise of the Mario character that the show established continued to be used by Nintendo, but Lou never got to permanently be the voice of Mario, nor did Walker Boone, the guy who played Mario in the two follow-up American cartoons, or Bob Hoskins, who played Mario in the notoriously awful live-action Mario Brothers movie. But then, in 1992, Nintendo decided to hire a permanent actor to fill that role, someone who could, going forward, provide Mario's voice for the games, now that that technology existed, as well as at trade shows and other public appearances. Appearances. And in a testament to just how much Nintendo of Japan was deferring to America for the management of the Mario character by this point, it was decided that Nintendo's American team would be responsible for hiring this actor. And the guy they chose was Charles Martinet, a professional voice actor from California. Charles loves to tell the story of his audition, and what's interesting is how he consciously chose to take the character in a somewhat less American direction than had been established in the cartoons, and instead made Mario a bit more, let's just say, unassimilated. I actually crashed an audition 23 years ago to do this amazing character, and I had never heard of him, never heard of Nintendo. I said, can I read for this? And the guy looked at his watch and he goes, ah. All right, come on in. You're an Italian plumber from Brooklyn. Uh, you know, I'm sitting there thinking, you know, uh, you know, uh, Italian plumber from Brooklyn, you know. Hey, how you doing? You know, I'm under your sink. Maybe too much is showing. Don't bother me. Yeah, and I thought, well, you know, that's not the voice because in my, the choices that I've made, I, I don't want to do something if I'm going to be talking to people that's gruff and mean to them, you know, that, that, or could be sort of like scary to, to children. And all of a sudden I hear action. I go, hello, I'm a Mario. Let's make a pizza pie together. You go get some sausage. I'm going to get some spaghetti. We put spaghetti in the sausage and the pizza. And he said, you know, cut, stop talking. There's no more tape. All right, thanks. We'll be in touch. And I, I thought that was the end of it for me, but uh, I, he called Nintendo and said, I found our Mario. I got him and only sent my tape up. And that was 23 absolutely marvelous years ago. Charles Martinet really comes off as such a lovely person. He knows he's hit one of life's great jackpots in getting to voice one of the world's most profitable characters, and he seems endlessly grateful for it. But his 20-year run may be coming to an end. As I film this, the world is a few weeks away from a brand new Mario Brothers movie starring Christopher Pratt as the voice of Mario and doing a much more assimilated Italian-American New Yorker accent. I'm not afraid. I'll do anything for my brother. Depending on how well the movie does, you could imagine a whole generation of kids growing up expecting Mario to sound like Chris Pratt, just as the previous generation expected him to sound like Charles Martinet, and my generation expected him to sound like Lou Albano. All right, let us now do a quick review. Mario is a character that a Japanese designer made as a stand-in for an American comic book star. He was named by Americans, and his look was refined by an American artist inspired by American animation traditions, though later refined in Japan. His biography was invented by an American TV series, and he has been voiced by a string of American actors. But when it comes to the bread and butter of his fame, his status as a video game star, he continues to owe it entirely to a Japanese studio. In fact, correct me if I am wrong, but I believe in Mario's entire 40-year history, there has never been a major Mario game made in America. So, I will leave it up to you. Do you think a Mario mug belongs in an American culture museum gift shop? Let me know in the comments and I will see you next week.